Welcome to the latest episode of Double Feature, and welcome to 2024 for that matter. I'm your host Pedro, and as per usual, I'll be talking about two movies today. But not just two ordinary movies. Two adaptations of novels penned by Ira Levin. All right. Hollywood has always had a massive fascination with adapting popular best-selling novels. Mainly because they would almost certainly turn a profit, even if they sucked. The book adapted into the movie world had its pink map moment in the mid-1990s when John Grisham, John Le Carré and Stephen King divided the world in three. But before this prolific writer started to collect royalties on their books, there was a little-known writer whose works in various genres including thriller, horror and science fiction you may have heard of. I'm talking about Ira Levin, the author of Rosemary's Baby. Out of the seven books he penned between 1953 and 1997, five have been adapted onto the big screen. And whereas This Perfect Day has been shamefully ignored and never truly considered for a cinematic outing, the less people hear about The Son of Rosemary, the better. Levin's work, despite being vast in tone and settings, finds the author consistently exploring a similar list of topics paranoia, and the sinister underbelly of seemingly perfect societies, the notion of identity and privacy, and the unethical usage of technology. His books are usually well thought out, and the narrative is compelling, leaving you wanting more. And speaking of wanting more, I'd like to introduce you to Double Feature's unofficial sponsor, The Stuff, a low-fat alternative to ice cream. A delightful treat that doesn't compromise on flavor or creaminess. Made with all natural ingredients, this incredible snack is even suitable for your vegan friends. Rich in yumminess, it grows inside you to the point where you simply say, Mmm, I can't get enough of the stuff. Now back to Ira Levin. In 1967, his second novel, Rosemary's Baby, became a bestseller, and a year later, Roman Polanski directed the novel's adaptation. It was his first American movie, and a colossal hit. Personally, I find it to be one of the most effective birth control solutions, on par with Clifford. And whilst his 1976 effort, The Boys from Brazil, and its respective movie version were met with critical and commercial acclaim, the same cannot be said about his least successful adaptations. So to show some of these unsung movies some love, I'm reviewing the other two Ira Levin novels that were adapted into movies. Two dark thrillers that explore the topics of control and manipulation. Two titles that find their lead female protagonists placed in disturbing or unsettling environments. Two movies that tackle unsettling themes related to societal expectations and the consequences of pursuing an idealized version of life. So let's get to it! In the town of Stepford, the men are getting exactly what they always dreamed of, perfect wives. And the dream is becoming a nightmare for the Stepford wives. A very modern suspense story from the author of Rosemary's Baby. The Stepford Wives about what men can do behind closed doors. Uh, they were telling me about the Men's Association. Right now it's strictly men only. Not to mention that creepy Men's Association. We moved here about two months ago. And Ed joins this Men's Association. Anything that gets him out of the house nights is fine with me. I like to watch women doing little domestic chores. When originally published in 1972, Ira Levin's The Stepford Wives became a cultural phenomenon, gaining widespread popularity. Released at the height of the 1970s feminist movement, the horror satire provided a bleak vision of a reality where women themselves would end up being replaced altogether. Levin's contemporary take on women and women's suburban alienation, man's resistance to feminist change and overall deconstruction of the paradise of suburbia were incredibly effective and extremely relevant. As a result, Hollywood was keen to bring the book to life through a movie adaptation, hoping to replicate Rosemary's Baby's success. In 1975, the movie adaptation was released in the United States with Catherine Ross in the lead role after the likes of Diane Keaton, Jacqueline Bissett, Natalie Wood and Jane Fonda all passed on the opportunity. 
In The Stepford Wives, we are introduced to Joanna Eberhardt, played by Catherine Ross, and her husband Walter, played by Peter Masterson, an urban couple who moved to Stepford with their children, seeking a quieter life away from the hustle and bustle of New York City. However, Joanna soon discovers that something peculiar is happening in the seemingly perfect community. She finds it hard to make friends in the new home. Her only friends are Bobby Marco, a fellow Stepford newcomer, and trophy wife Charmaine Wimperis. Bonded by their principles and beliefs, the three organize a women's liberation club, but fail to spark the interest of the other women in the community. Joanna is then set on a quest to find out what's really happening and what's the sinister reason behind the strange behaviors in Stepford. The movie ended up receiving mixed reviews and underperformed commercially. Granted, you can see the plot twist coming a mile away, and neither the movie nor the novel went to great lengths to hide what's really happening to the women in Stepford. There is one significant difference between the book and the movie, though. Levin really focuses on the science fiction and horror aspects of the narrative, whereas through William Goldman's script and Brian Forbes' direction, the movie shifts its tone between satire and social commentary, undermining the elements that worked so well in the novel. As a result, the movie alienated feminist audiences who perceived the overall message and execution as anti-woman, and horror and sci-fi enthusiasts were expecting a smarter, more subtle take on 1970s society. Whilst The Stepford Wives does tend to drag out a bit, with plenty of superfluous sequences, it is saved by a great performance delivered by Catherine Ross, and some well-executed sequences that heighten the stakes. The movie also does a great job of portraying Joanna's gradual descent into full detachment from reality, a journey that starts even as the couple is still in New York. The movie does have a strong message around the individuality and freedom of choice, both aspects that are implicitly championed, as well as a dramatic take on the price to be paid for any deviation from acceptable conformity. That said, the movie is best appreciated as a relic of the 1970s, and it's best if you take its significance cultural footprint and iconic status with a pinch of salt. Just stay for the title's relevant message. I mean, as many modern day reviewers state, The Stepford Wives is just Jordan Peele's get out for white women. Perhaps that's the right mindset to be on when deciding to watch this movie? Central air conditioning? Absolutely terrific. Carly Norris knew what she wanted. I'll take the apartment. A prestigious address. So you're moving in today. Welcome to 113. You'll like it here. I will, thank you. Sliver follows the story of Carly Norris, played by Sharon Stone, a book editor who moves into a luxurious Manhattan high-rise apartment building as she is trying to start her life again after a divorce. She immediately develops a connection with some of the building's residents, including video game designer Zeke, played by discounted Alec Baldwin, novelist Jack, played by an unhinged Tom Berenger, Vida, a fashion model who moonlights as a call girl, and Gus, a professor of videography at NYU. Things take an interesting turn when a group of international terrorists take over the building during the Christmas party and it's up to Carly to rescue the hostage residents and save Christmas. What are you talking about? There's nothing like that in there. Well, you see, when I get bored, I make up my own movie. I have a very short attention span. But our point is very simple. You see, when... Oh, look, a bird! <laughs> nah. The real movie plot is actually far less interesting. The building has a dark history, having been the setting of the murder of a past tenant, Naomi Singer, with whom Carly bears a striking resemblance. As Carly settles into her new home, she begins to notice that the building is equipped with an extensive network of surveillance cameras, allowing residents to spy on each other. Intrigued and disturbed by the invasion of privacy, Carly investigates the mysterious deaths of the previous tenants who, much like some political figures in the communist bloc, fell from the building window. As the investigation continues, she finds herself to be the voyeuristic killer's next target. Now, it's easy to understand why there were high expectations for this movie, and why you would be persuaded to check it out. First, it starred the sex symbol of the early 90s, Sharon Stone, who in the previous year had starred in Basic Instinct, one of 1992's highest-grossing movies. Second, it was penned by Joe Esterhaz, 
one of the most sought-after screenwriters at the time, and the author of Basic Instinct. We are talking about a man who reportedly netted 26 million for the scripts he wrote in the 1990s. Basically, he could do the Sunday crossword puzzle and net a cool million. A quick look into the man's body of work and you find incredible gems, including 1995's Jade, no pun intended, and the most incredible tour de force ever created, the story of Nomi Malone, a caffeine pill addict who is forced to become an exotic dancer in Las Vegas to finance her Bolivian bean dependency. But the truth is, Sliver failed to capture the magic and horniness of Basic Instinct. Not only that, it features a remarkably flat direction by Philip Noyce, the filmmaker responsible for tense thrillers like Dead Calm and The Bone Collector. The film also finds Sharon Stone playing a passive, unconvincing character who's the exact opposite of Catherine Trammell. And the least said about Billy Baldwin, the better. On top of that, Sliver fails in its execution on two different fronts. First, it seems to shoehorn awkward sex scenes wherever it can, not surprising considering the movie was produced by Robert Evans. But the lack of chemistry between Stone and both Baldwin and Berenger, along with the amount of suspension of disbelief required to accept what you are seeing, result in a movie that's incredibly unsexy. And second, there's simply no suspense, no tension, no logic. Noyce and Esserhaus went for a Hitchcock slash De Palma atmosphere that could have been a landmark event and core entry in the erotic thriller, as it had all the potential for exploring the use of the latest technology as an enabler for voyeurism 2.0, and a device that disrupted one's personal space in a way that had never been possible before. Instead, all the security equipment and intrusive technology are reduced to mere yuppie toys and are completely devoid of any deeper message as the plot moves along. So, you may be asking, why the hell should we watch Sliver? Well, because once you park your brain and embrace the so bad it's good vibe, you are in for a treat. Sliver contains scenery-chewing sequences galore, a continuous, unintentionally bad take on what a smooth player should be, and its potential of a great drinking game, where you down a shot every time Billy Baldwin says panties in an awkward manner. You like the bra and panties? What about the panties? Yes, the panties. So for all your guilty pleasure viewing needs, Sliver is a safe bet, and probably the reason why in the last 30 years there have been no IR-11 adaptations. That's a shame. No. That's a man. None whatsoever, and I don't believe anyone who says otherwise. Once again, I'm Pedro from Vinyl and Celluloid, thanks for watching, and if you are interested in finding out my thoughts on other movies, go over to my letterbox page where you can find over 300 movie reviews penned by yours truly. Until next time, keep the reels rolling.